like you to watch this video for a moment. Nun will ich euch beweisen, dass Gott, wenn es ihn gibt, böse ist. Hat Gott alles, was existiert, erschaffen? Wenn Gott alles erschaffen hat, dann hat er auch das Böse geschaffen. Das bedeutet, Gott ist böse. Herr Professor, existiert Kälte? Was für eine Frage soll das sein? Natürlich existiert die Kälte. War euch noch nie kalt? Nein, in der Tat, Herr Professor, die Kälte existiert nicht. Nach den Gesetzen der Physik ist das, was wir als kalt empfinden, nur das Fehlen von Wärme. Und existiert Dunkelheit, Herr Professor? Selbstverständlich existiert sie. Nein, sie ist nur das Fehlen von Licht. Wir können das Licht messen, aber die Dunkelheit nicht. Das Böse existiert nicht, genau wie die Kälte und die Dunkelheit. Gott hat das Böse nicht geschaffen. Es ist das Ergebnis dessen, was Gott es halt noch nicht berührt hat. We live in a world where people have different ideas or no ideas in relationships to God. And I want us to consider something. Among the ancient Greeks, and we'll have an image come up here in a moment, there's a story of a father and son. And they were wrestling with a question that many still wrestle with today and have for centuries, and that's the origins of things. And among the ancient Greeks, there was the popular idea that Atlas was holding the world. And his son asked him, What's Atlas standing on? And his father said, Atlas is standing on a gray turtle. And then his son asked, what's the turtle standing on? And his father said, the turtle's standing on an even greater turtle. Well, his son kept asking and started to frustrate his father. Well, what's that turtle standing on? And his father said, son, there are turtles all the way down. To which his son responded, down to what? <laughs> of course, I want us to realize we serve a real God. Mm. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 18 and go down through 32. And in this text, we, we could really pull out several messages in this text. But I want us to read this whole context. This is a section uh, where your Bible might have its subtitle. I know in mine it says, God's wrath against unrighteousness. Or it might, my, your, yours might say, God's wrath against mankind or something along those lines. But let's look here. And I don't have this on the screen. So I want you to follow along and listen. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, you get that part? They knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Well, there's a list right there you don't want to be in the middle of. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Wow. A couple of things I want us to consider as we talk about a real God. A real God. The first is the external testimony of creation itself. Now, the Bible does not seek and go after trying to prove God exists. It already assumes He exists. However, we can deduce from many things in the Scriptures that there are evidences to show us that God exists. And he tells us what one of those evidences is here in Romans 1, and that's the creation itself bears witness and testimony to the existence of God. So it's supported by the evidence, by the testimony of creation itself. Genesis 1.1, you're probably very familiar with. In the beginning, what? God. First thing mentioned right out of the gate. Created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hand. And there are other scriptures. These are not the only ones by any means. That speak of the creation itself. Giving testimony to God. Glorifying God. Showing something of his power. Of his character. Of his glory. Now being creator. Implies a couple of things. One. That he began it. And two. That he designed it. And we need to keep that in mind. It wasn't just a random thing. That occurred. It was designed. External evidence of creation. Reveals. That there was a beginner. In verse 20 of our text here in Romans, chapter 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now let me just pause there for a moment. Get on a little sidetrack, but hopefully get back to the main. How many times, maybe, have you heard of someone who said, Well, what about that person in the forest reaches of the Amazon who's never heard the gospel? God's already revealed himself to him. Even if no one physically went with the gospel message to that person, God has revealed himself in the creation itself. Sounds to me like, because it says they're without excuse, and God has revealed himself in the creation, 
that they are going to be held accountable to the revelation they have already received from God. Now, I'm not sure that that would be, even be the case, that we have that person. Because I know the gospel message has gone throughout just about every land that there is. It may not be translated in every language, although that work is underway, but people have heard the gospel message in every continent. But even if we assume that, God has revealed himself, made manifest who he is in creation. And he goes on to say, but instead of worshiping the creator, they worship the creation. And that's where idolatry entered the scene. And you go to most of the ancient civilizations, and they have some weird-looking gods. Part man, part beast, and all kinds of things. And not just one or two of them, thousands of them. They worship in the creation of their own making instead of the creator. Now, I know scientists of various sorts dispute something of the origins of the universe. But there's one thing I have found that I have yet to find a, a, a scientist to, to disagree on, regardless of which side of the origin issue they're on, and that is they all pretty much say the universe is expanding. It's getting larger and larger. Okay, so let's go back in time. If something's expanding, if you go backwards, what does it do? It contracts, doesn't it? It's smaller and smaller and smaller. Until when? Until it gets to a point of a singularity of some beginning. Now, how far back that is, it is a debated issue among scientists of all sorts. But it goes back to a point in time where there was a beginning. Of course, as Christians, we, we see it clearly stated in the scriptures of how that beginning emerged. You go back to Genesis 1, we see that. They may, cause it, they may call it intelligent design, some scientists, of a creator, an uncaused cause. Because if you say everything had a cause, then you have to ask the question, what caused God? Right? But what they don't take into account is eternal. They see a timeline with a beginning point, and they can't get past that to what was before. Because in our limited human existence, we are in the timeline. But it comes back to a point of singularity that things began. In the beginning, God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the Big Bang I believe in. God said, let there be light, boom, there was light. Not the Big Bang that evolutionists look at. And it all fits. It all fits. Secondly, after looking at something of the testimony of creation, we could go on this for a long period of time. We could do a series of studies just on that. But I want us to look at the universe also shows a design. And if it's got a design, there must be a designer. Design requires intelligence. And the Bible shows intelligent design being done way back in Genesis 1. We go back to the beginning, we see God was active in designing things. Look at the days of creation. Each day set apart for a specific thing to be designed and put in place. We have the light. We have, we have the waters being created. We have the land. We have the, the animals. All the things of creation designed in a very orderly fashion. By the way, I, I remember a video I saw a couple of years back when I was instructing my apologetics class and uh, I remember it talking it was sort of going through the process that evolutionists see as creation and then it went on to talk about explosions pretty much 
Every explosion known to man destroys. Doesn't it? Some explodes, it disintegrates, it falls apart, it breaks down, it's uh, blown to smithereens, as I used to say as a kid. How many explosions create? Hmm. Interesting. But God designed things in an orderly fashion. It wasn't random. It wasn't by chance. And there are design elements all over the place. Even if you're not all into science and evidences uh, in science, just look around for a moment. Look at parts of creation. Because God tells us it, it testifies to who he is. When you see the ocean, you see that beautiful sunset, you see the mountains, you see some, something awe-inspiring, maybe the Grand Canyon, the Redwood Forest, or something else. Some of you, I'm sure, have traveled to some places and just saw something and went, wow, who can, who can look at that and not believe there's a creator who designed this universe? And we could go on and on with examples of that. Some of you probably have seen that. Something has just struck you with a, a sense of awe in that moment. Even down to our human body. And, the, and the, going down to the DNA level, it shows information. That's what DNA is. It's, it's an information within our molecular structure. And I am by no means a molecular biologist. But there's information, and our bodies are put together in such a, a wonderful way. But if there's information, what's that mean? There's code. That means it was designed. And we could go into another whole study there. So the creation shows evidence of an intelligent design. So if there's intelligence before creation, what is it? Well, we have that answer. It's God. Who is there all along? Thirdly, there is testimony even within our own conscience. Even within our own conscience. So this is, this is not one I can necessarily put into a laboratory and do a scientific experiment with over and over to confirm. <coughs> but look, uh, look at what he says in verse 28. Of Romans 1. They did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to depraved mind that they do what ought not to be done. Paul tells us they did not retain the knowledge of God, the knowledge that He has given into each one of us. I think perhaps that's because we were created in His image. And as part of being created in His image, He put that sense within us, that spiritual capacity to understand a greater spiritual creator who is there. Look at verses 21 and 23, if you back up a couple of verses. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God or gave thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. In our consciousness, we have this sense of knowing that there is some type of intelligent design. There is a God. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Mankind has this innate knowledge of God within him even if there are those who choose to resist it and not acknowledge it. Mankind also has this sense of right and wrong within him. Now how'd that get there? No matter what culture you go to in the world today, if I just walk into some country and just kill somebody, murder someone for no good reason, I'm probably going to face a consequence. Now, I know laws are different across lands and countries, but there's usually this sense of right and wrong that's there. Where did that come from? 
If there's already this sense of right and wrong, that to me is an indicator there must be an absolute. And that absolute is God. God has written certain moral truths upon our hearts. Just as Paul wrote about in Romans 2. You pull over a page or two. Romans 2, 14 and 15. It says, When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciousness, or consciousness, also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. So even those who didn't have the law, the Old Testament law, the Gentiles, live as if they have a law. Where did that come from? So it's written on their hearts and in their conscience. It's part of our makeup. Now it's the rejection of what God has given us that perverts our consciences. It's the rejection which brings sin. And it's that rejection, it's sin, which has brought in suffering and pain into the world. Sin perverted life and brought into the world death and suffering and pain. I can't think of any good consequence for sin. There just isn't. The wages of sin is death. It's brought in suffering. It's brought in pain. But praise God, He can even use our sin, our suffering and pain in time to do a wonderful thing. He can turn that tragedy into a triumph. And as I've said before, that's the core message of the cross. The cross was a tragedy. That wasn't something anybody in the world ever boasted in or looked for. By the power of his resurrection, he gave power to the cross and turned that tragedy into something triumphant. How many of you would be walking around wearing jewelry of things that were so tragic? If all we had was a crucifixion and no resurrection, I doubt anybody's going to be wearing crosses on jewelry. But it's because of the victory in the blood of Christ through the resurrection that we use those little mementos as reminders and symbols of what he has done. Well, if there is a God, could he just end suffering? Yes, and he will. That's in his plan. He could have created a world where nobody had a choice. But love cannot be forced. He wanted to have a relationship with us. And to have that relationship, you've got a choice with love. To accept or reject who he is and what he has offered. <clears throat> if you reject who he is, you're not going to accept what he's offered. Sin has brought suffering and death into the world. And to eliminate suffering and death would mean to eliminate choice. Our free will. Now I know I can hurt and not be my fault. It could be someone else's fault. But it's still sin. My sin might hurt you. Your sin might hurt me. And sometimes my own sins hurt myself. Right? But it's not fair. I got it's someone else's fault. You know, you're right, it's not fair. It's not the way God designed it. Sin destroys the very essence of what God designed. But he's seeking one day to come to restore that relationship. So he has revealed himself. He's also revealed himself through his son and his word. And I could do another whole message right there. Just reveal himself. It strikes me funny when uh, we think of atheists and atheism, those who do not believe in God, that there is no God. 
the fact that they even say the word God in the, in the discussions. I mean, think about that. If you really don't believe there's a God, why are you even going to say that word or name? But exist, why even acknowledge the term? Well, the world is full of contradictions, isn't it? And sometimes our lives are too, aren't they? But if God is not real, what's the choice? What's the alternative? What's the option? What hope do we have if there is no God? And if there is no God, every one of us in this room right now are fools. Paul tells us that. If the dead have not been raised, we're fools. If God does not exist, we're fools. To even be here. I, I would dare say even those that, that come and visit, those who may not be longtime members that come and visit, why do they even come? If they did not believe there was a God in the first place, would they even be here? Now, we welcome them, and we're glad that our visitors are here. And we want to share more about God and the hope they can have in Him, the peace they can have in Him, the salvation they can have. That's our message, to let the world know there is a hope. Not just for this life, but for what's beyond, because we serve a real God who is there before time began. He's once started. And He will be there long after that timeline, however long it is, for this earth, whenever that end date, expiration date occurs. And he comes. But time will still go on even though the current existence won't. There's a real God. And here's something so amazing. He's not just this distant God who created things, wound it up, and then left it to run its own devices. He came and interacted among us in person through Jesus Christ. He wants to have that relationship. And that real God who created everything, this still just amazes and astounds me, cares enough for you and for me. And he invites you to know what we talked about last week, his real love. He invites you to do that. So as the praise team comes up, let me just share a couple of thoughts. If God is not real, this life is all there is. And if you believe God is not real, then you better eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you die. That's it. You're nothing but worm food at that point. That's it. But we're created in God's name. We have that spiritual part of us that yearns for things even beyond this life. And God invites us that we can only find that hope and peace in Him. So if we talk about this Creator God who's real and made all things, and we just touch on a few of the things bearing witness and evidence, <coughs> yet He invites me, He invites you, personally known. He invites you to participate in hope. This world seeks for hope in a lot of places. In a lot of those places, all those places, ultimately don't give it. But only in God. Let's stand together, please. God invites you to draw closer to Him. He invites you to know the creator of the universe. And to do that, we have to come through Jesus Christ. Because he said, I am the Father of one. You know me, you know the Father. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if we want to know the creator of the universe, because Jesus was there in the beginning. Just go back and read John 1. He was there in the beginning. Everything that was made was made by him. And he wants to know you. Wow. Let's sing our song.